Hello there, my friend. Welcome to another episode of Talk Music Talk with Boyce. I am Boyce. This is my podcast you are listening to. It is a weekly music interview podcast where I have long-form conversations with people connected to music from different genres and different backgrounds, established and emerging singers, singer-songwriters, performers, music journalists, and music therapists. And on this new episode, I had the pleasure of speaking to Eric Morse. Eric is a children's author, and he has a new book out called What is Hip Hop? out on Akashic Books, featuring text by Eric, 3D clay figures by Annie E., and it was also produced by journalist Nelson George. This is actually Eric's second book. His first one was What is Punk?, also a children's book. And What is Hip Hop is a cool kids book following the history of hip hop from its early days of Bronx block parties and DJs to the present day. It deals with hip hop in all its forms, not just the music, but also graffiti and break dancing. And it's also it's a great book because it talks about issues of racism and politics and feminism, but in a way that kids can understand and that adults can have have conversations with them about. In this conversation, Eric talks about why he wrote the book and also his own personal experience with hip hop and the music and the culture and what that was like growing up in the suburbs of St. Louis and being a white kid loving hip hop in the 80s. It's a great conversation with Eric and a great book. You should check it out. Here it is without further ado, my interview with author Eric Morse on Talk Music talk enjoy the new book what is hip-hop is out now mm-hmm. right yeah and i'm curious it's for kids was there a specific a picture book specific age group uh a little bit so the age group for this book the the publisher akashic has it listed at i think three to seven okay um so as you probably know but i'll I'll throw it in there. Okay. This book, What is Hip Hop, is actually a follow-up to What is Punk, yeah. um, which is a book that came out almost exactly two years ago, uh, and it was written with the same illustrator, mm-hmm. um, picture book. And when I started writing What is Punk, um, my kids were all really young. I, in fact, when I started writing it, I had two kids. Yeah. And now I now have four kids. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I was in the middle of reading books that were mostly kind of rhymy or, you know, cute picture books yeah. for like the kind of toddler preschooler range. Um, and the idea behind or, or one of the things that I wanted to accomplish with what is punk and same with what is hip hop mm-hmm. is... Um, I wanted it to be, I wanted to tell the story of this genre of music that was important to me and mm-hmm. I think is important to the parents who are reading it to the kids. Yeah. Um, and so with both hip hop and punk, it was, you know, there's some stuff in there that's kind of heavy. Yeah, <laughs> there's yeah. some characters in there. It's sort of hard to explain to, you know, little kids. Um, and so, it was a specific choice to mm-hmm. write it in rhyming couplets and have this sort of like Dr. Seussian kind of language yeah. and it's sort of like bouncy, you know, uh, language uh-huh. and, and rhyme and all that stuff. Um, and so that lends itself, I think, more to like the three to seven range. Okay. You know, it's it's made to be read to kids who some of whom might not pick up all of it, but mm-hmm. who can kind of like enjoy the pictures because the illustrations are amazing. Uh, and also kind of like the sound of the mm-hmm. language as well as as really kind of diving into what it means and who these people are okay. and all that stuff. So long answer. That's a long answer. Yeah. But yeah, I'd say three to seven, mm-hmm. kind of preschool to, you know, kindergarten, first grade, maybe second grade. Okay. Yeah. And what is it uh, about hip hop that you want to relate? What is it you want to relate to a three well, to seven year old? Uh, you know, as a parent, I grew up loving hip hop. Mm-hmm. And I was, so I was born in the early 70s. I was around, I mean, I guess I was just starting to really appreciate and listen to music mm-hmm. right as hip hop was taking off. Yeah. And um it was my first musical love. 
Uh, and so it was, it was funny. I, I, I like to kind of laugh with friends and tell stories about being, you know, a white kid mm-hmm. in the suburbs of St. Louis. Um, and like, going to school in my parachute pants and like yeah. break dancing during <laughs> recess and uh-huh. stuff. Um, and so it was the first, it was the first real kind of musical and cultural movement that I personally identified mm-hmm. with. And so as a result, you know, obviously it's been important ever, important to yeah. me ever since and kind of formative in that way. Um, and, uh, so again, you know, kind of coming full circle as a parent, and watching my kids grow up and get, you know, influenced mm-hmm. culturally by pop culture or by music or by their friends, um, I think it's pretty natural to want to kind of impart um, that what's important to you yeah, and, yeah. and what you loved as a kid to your kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's something that was important to me through what is hip hop. And the other thing is obviously hip hop. I think more than any other sort of pop cultural movement mm-hmm. is really kind of attached to its roots, you know? Yeah. Um, even now, like we just celebrated the 40th anniversary of Cool Herc's first like party, yeah. you know? And kind of, you know, a moment that a lot of people feel like is kind of the founding mm-hmm. moment of hip hop. So it's 40 years old or for some people around 30 years old or whatever, but that's far enough along that obviously hip hop mm-hmm. as a culture and as a musical genre has changed so much. Yeah. Um, but it really like anybody who calls himself a hip hop fan, like you can sit them, you can say the words run DMC and yeah. they will like, everybody agrees, mm-hmm. you know, they will go. Um, and it's not really so much that way in other musical genres. I mean, obviously, you know, there's jazz greats, mm-hmm. And, um, there are beloved rock acts, but people who love Led Zeppelin don't necessarily love the Ramones, you know? Um, but anyway, so, so hip hop has a a real kind of, kind of, um, connection to its roots. Mm -hmm. Um, but now hip hop is really different from what hip hop had been. And so writing this book and telling the story Mm -hmm. of, you know, these names who my kid might not necessarily encounter, uh, I felt like was, was important to, you know, yeah. again, to kind of impart. Okay. Yeah. And, and the, of those 40 years, do you have a particular favorite period? Of <laughs> That's hip-hop? hard because on a personal level, you know, as I said, I was in my early teens in those mid eighties mm-hmm. years when, I mean, it was exploding and, you know, Eric B and Rakim and yeah. LL Cool J, Run DMC, Beastie Boys, like it was exploding and it was exploding in, in a lot of different directions. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, another year or so goes by and then you've got Public Enemy and then yeah. another year goes by and you've got NWA. And so like really like being that age then, mm-hmm. you know, it's hard to ever kind of have the same visceral reaction to something or attachment to something that yeah, you, yeah. that you might have when you were 16. Mm-hmm. Um, but then in the nineties, I was actually a music critic and, and, a, and a writer and I had a much more, um, kind of, I, I connected with the art form much more as an art form. Mm. And so I have real love for nineties hip hop just because you know, personally, I feel and I think a lot of people agree that 90s hip hop was, you know, they, they call it the golden age for a reason. Like yeah. it was a, it was a real it was it was an amazing period. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I don't know, as as a listener, I might sit down and put on, you know, a Gangstar record mm-hmm. or a most deaf record. Um, but as a person, if you ask me, like, who or what, you know, album I most identify with, I mm-hmm. think it would probably end up being some early, you know, earlier old school hip hop. It okay. might be a cool J record. It might be a run DMC record. Uh-huh. Um, 
Yeah, it's it's hard. Though. <laughs> That's like asking me to pick my favorite child. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I, <laughs> I won't. Say and they that. know I the answer it. to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they know <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Nobody's saying though. Yeah, you don't have to tell them. They know. <laughs> <laughs> This is someone who doesn't have kids. This thing, this, right? <laughs> <laughs> Growing up in Missouri, mm-hmm. what, when were you first exposed to hip hop? It's or weird it looking for you. Looking back on it now, I mean, I knew about hip hop really early on, and mm-hmm. it's funny because I don't really know why yeah. or how that happened. Um, uh, at that period. So the answer to your question is probably 81. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I remember all the Sugar Hill Gang yeah. songs. Like those were, I was listening to those when they were, you know, breaking. Yeah. And I think maybe it's because my brother, like, so my brother's seven years older than I mm-hmm. am. So he was in his mid teens. Like he was really kind of, in that moment where you're the most kind of passionate about music, yeah. 15, 16, when I was eight or nine. And so that was around 81, 82. And um, I remember, this is off the off the subject of hip-hop yeah. a little bit, but I remember him coming home with uh, Prince 1999. Okay. <laughs> and um, like he liked it the way anybody else liked it. But as somebody who just... I idolized my brother you know i felt way more passionately yeah, about anything yeah. that he, so I, I mean you know i i haven't recovered from my my prince obsession <laughs> ever since he brought home 1999 yeah. and um but anyway so he started listening to prince so i started listening to prince and because he liked prince and i like prince i liked the time way more mm-hmm. than you know so um so i kind of I remember he had Prince records and he had like Billy Squire records or, you know, whatever. Like he was, he was pretty broad with it, but I went full on into that. So, um, so I was listening to black radio, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, I feel like I can say it because that's what we called it back then. Um, uh, and I think because of that, isn't that crazy that you just said black radio (laughs) and it was like anything from, you know, they would have the quiet storm on yeah, Friday yeah, night, yeah, yeah. you know, or same. That's Pittsburgh. what we called it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess each radio station had a different. We like, called brand. it that in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Did you? And they would play the Smokey Robinson. Yeah. Yeah. As the first track. Every <laughs> that's <night>. right. <laughs> you had to kick it off with that. Yeah. My uh, old boss, I used to uh, work for this radio station. She worked at was it Howard, I believe, in mm-hmm. her class, her few classmates. They started the quiet storm at college really and she said if she would have knew then they would have copyrighted it and they never yeah. did yeah yeah nowadays everything's a brand and yeah. you like definitely <laughs> do that that's funny but um anyway so i think that's what how i was able to kind of connect with it so relatively mm-hmm. early like i don't think that hip-hop you know ex- had established its like broader yeah. crossover audience until later. Okay. But at that point, yeah, like so uh, you know, I was listening to mm-hmm. the message. Okay. And, um, um was it hard for you to find hip hop? Because I know in Pittsburgh in the beginning, like there would be they wouldn't play it during certain times of the day. <laughs> And, you know, because there was still this divide between R&B and hip hop and hip hop yeah. wasn't necessarily, or well, rap at that time wasn't right. necessarily real music. So yeah, there were people right. who loved R&B, they didn't want to hear rap. Yeah. And so you, I remember the DJs going like, hold on, we're going to play Rapper's Delight. Yeah. <laughs> but it would be like after six or something like that. Mm-hmm. So was it hard for you to find? Yeah, hip-hop? I remember tuning yeah. in. There was, there was, oh, I wish I could remember the name of the DJ, but like, yeah, there was a show. Mm-hmm. That I think was like seven to ten. Yeah. I think was the slot. And um, after I finished my homework, then I was allowed to listen to the radio. Oh, yeah. And you know, you would like sit there with your two fingers on the play and record button, yeah. and like hit the song <laughs> that you like, and you know, record the whole track, the whole like six minutes. Yeah. You know, uh, um, and uh, and and then I would play the tapes over and over again mm-hmm. whenever I whenever I needed yeah. to. 
How was it for you? You're a white kid listening to black music. Was that like you went to a black, mostly black? No, I went to a. Next. I went to a private school mm-hmm. in like a very white okay. suburb. Yeah. Um, and back then, it really was like this is white music and this is black yeah. music because I was a kid listening to both. But I would people would actually come up to me in school and go, "Oh, are you that black kid who likes white music." <laughs> yeah. So, yeah so it really was like a thing during that period to listen to music that people didn't look like you yeah yeah um it's interesting because it was so exciting to me mm-hmm. and you know kind of edgy i mean not kind of edgy <laughs> oh, yeah. but specifically edgy not mm-hmm. just uh, musically, but also, you know, the content and the yeah. fact that I was a white kid listening mm-hmm. to that. Um, it was, it was, I think I, I liked that yeah, part yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it was also interesting because, like I said, I, I was in a very white, um, environment. Mm-hmm. Um, but for some reason, just because of the geography of it and, and, the demographics, for whatever reason, our little league leagues mm-hmm. were super integrated. Yeah. So I think maybe because it wasn't a very densely populated mm-hmm. area, um, in order to get the right number of kids, they yeah. had a pretty broad geographic okay. range um, or region. And so, um, especially my football league, this is such a weird thing to be talking about, uh-huh. but as I think about it, I... I was in the minority. I was one of the f- relatively few white kids yeah, yeah. on my football team. Um, and uh, that was awesome. Like mm-hmm. it was, of course, sort of terrifying for a nine-year-old, yeah. but um, but it was also awesome because like it, it was, I just, I was so kind of enthralled mm-hmm. with the way they acted and yeah. were, what they were into and, um, you know, like we, we like would, we would like, we had this beat that we would like pound out on our uh-huh. pads and it was like so badass yeah. and you know, like <laughs> that wasn't anything any of the white kids were doing yeah, yeah. and I, I loved it. I just ate it up and, um, yeah, I, I learned pretty quickly that, uh, it was just way more kind of exciting yeah. and fun. <laughs> um, and I remember the the Runs House tour, which was Run DMC, Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, uh-huh. Public Enemy, and um, JJ Fad okay. <laughs> uh, came through St. Louis. It was, it was obviously a big, you know, group tour, yeah. and they came through St. Louis. And um, I got tickets at at the the big stadium there. Um, and, um, yeah, I was one of the very few white people. This was probably 86, I mm-hmm. guess. So it was, it, it was at a point where it was, a, it was broad. Yeah. It was popular, but, um, it was still definitely, mm-hmm. you know, white kids were yeah, a minority. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I remember getting a lot of, a lot of looks, uh-huh. um, but I never <laughs> felt, you know, I never felt yeah, yeah. in danger or anything mm-hmm. of that. But, but yeah, we were definitely in the, being the white kids, yeah. we're definitely in the minority. Who took you, your brother? Yeah. Um, no, I remember who I went with. I went with my friend Jonathan Gibbs. Okay. I don't know if he's going to listen to this. Shout out to um, Jonathan. Shout out to Jono. <laughs> uh, and his little brother, Evan, who must have been 12. Yeah. Um, I don't know who the yeah. grown-up was. <laughs> Did oh, is it time where ourselves? a grown-up picks you up, drops you off, and then picks you up? I think so. <laughs> I think so. It's just funny looking back because I can't imagine my parents being cool with that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we definitely we definitely rode in the car with Jono's parents. Okay. Anyway, yeah. Got it. so. Did you rap any? Or did you ever try <laughs> rapping? No. Nah, there was a time when I thought about it. Uh-huh. <laughs> It, it didn't take me long to re- to realize that I I don't have a real good flow. Yeah, yeah. Um, I liked write. You know, I'm a writer, obviously, mm-hmm. and I liked writing a little bit. Yeah. It's funny because in recent years, I you know, people freestyle and they'll be like, "Eric, freestyle with yeah, us," and yeah. and um, 
I just, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> what I tried to do is just like it's stuck in 1988. Yeah, like yeah. I, you know. Yeah, it's, or do you like? Yes, you ever, yes, you, you ever go back? You, totally, <laughs> totally. If you ever go back and listen to, especially like a KRS One uh-huh. track uh, now, yeah, because you're, you're, it's sort of like this is cool because mm-hmm. KRS One are you know KRS One and Boogie Down Productions are among the founders and yeah. whatever, but it sounds nothing. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, it's so just. One, two, three, four, mm-hmm. rhyme, rhyme, rhyme. And now, you know, it's so much more complex. Yeah. So, um, so if someone were to just like step up to a mic right now and start rhyming <laughs> that way, it would sort of be like, oh, why yeah, don't yeah. you find another career? And that's kind of how I thought. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's no like natural flow yeah. there at all. Yeah. So you wrote a book on uh, punk rock. So was this going on at the same time? Uh, love it's, have funny, love it's funny because so i wrote the punk rock book first obviously mm-hmm. and um i did a whole round of promotion on that and talked to a lot of people who you know really identified with punk and identified as punks yeah. and we talked about you know childhood stuff and i always had to be like actually i grew up listening to hip-hop yeah, you know yeah. um and and I got into punk later. Uh, I think I, I think having the experience of being involved in any kind of subculture mm. or listening or and appreciating anything that was either an undercurrent or separate from the kind of normal, um, you know, dominant culture. Mm. Or popular thing at the moment, yeah. Um, I think is great and kind of important for kids, and I think that it also sets you up to be a little bit more kind of open minded mm. down the road. Um, so again, as a kid in my teenage years, it was a lot of hip hop, and then I kind of you know you meet girls and you get your mm. heart broken, and, yeah. And if you get your heart broken and you're a white kid in 1988, uh-huh. you're going to listen to The Cure, okay. you know? So, like, it's just unavoidable. They're, the Smiths exist, and so you have to listen to yeah, them. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so yeah, so I started going in that direction. Okay. And then in the 90s, um, after, in the 90s, I was, like you, I was involved in my college radio mm-hmm. station, and um, I was a music director of my college radio station for a year, and so that really... I really branched out there because I was just getting bombarded with all these CDs by bands I'd never heard of. And so I really kind of opened up. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I moved to Olympia, Washington, which is where Bikini Kill's from and where Slater Kinney's from. Mm -hmm. And it was a really real kind of um, epicenter of a specific kind of like indie punk that was happening in the mid-90s. And so, you know, then I kind of threw myself into the punk world. Mm -hmm. Um, it's funny, but going back to your question, I mean, we did have a clash cover band play at our, at our prom, I think. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I was aware of, of other kind of strains Mm -hmm. of, you know, genres and stuff. But it wasn't your main thing. But it wasn't my main thing. Yeah. I wasn't like, I wasn't like the Beastie Boys who could, you know. (laughs) <laughs> play a punk show, play uh, a hardcore show, and then play a hip hop show yeah, or whatever. Yeah. yeah, you weren't there yet. No, <laughs> no. Um, but yeah, I have a lot of respect for that now. Yeah. Where'd you go to uh, college? <laughs> I went to college in at DePaul University, okay. a small school in Indiana. Okay. Um, and it was. It's so funny to look back because. Um, And to kind of notice these various inflection points for me culturally and kind of in terms of identity, Mm -hmm. like we just talked about being a white kid in a white suburb, you know, obsessed with black music or black culture. And then um, going to school at this school that was very conservative, Brett Baer Mm -hmm. from Fox News 
um, was a couple years ahead of me okay. and knew him pretty well. So it was like those people, mm-hmm. you know, who would just like wear a tie and a navy blazer just because, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> um, and I felt really alienated by that. Like yeah. that wasn't me at all. And so that, you know, got me into college radio and got me kind of curious about these other mm-hmm. bands that were weird sounding. Yeah. Because they were such a, for me at least, a reaction against the norm mm. and that, like, you know, all these dudes are listening to Toad the Wet Sprocket or whatever and, like, <laughs> fuck that <laughs> yeah. kind of thing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, whatever. It gave me a good education. Yeah. Why'd you go there? Uh, to play football. Okay. Speaking of things that are very kind of all American yeah, and all yeah. that stuff. It was a division three school. It was one of the schools I could play at. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so it was funny cause I, you know, here I was small school. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I looked a certain way. I played football yeah. and I, people just expected me to be yeah, a certain yeah. type of person. And I just wasn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, that, kind of feeling the alienation mm. um, and feeling like I'm surrounded by a bunch of people who are not my people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it sucked at the time, but I think that it, you know, pushed me in the direction of all much more kind of subculture stuff. Okay. And, um, which personally I think makes for much more, Interesting yeah, and well adjusted yeah, yeah. adults. Yeah. <laughs> Did you find any of your tribe on in college? A little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I found like some people who were true misfits mm-hmm. or had been misfits a lot longer than I. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they had long hair or, you know, they dated people who were the same gender that they were, uh-huh. you know, like, oh my God. Um, <laughs> uh, and I fell in with them and they were always kind of like, like I was sort of a curiosity mm-hmm. because, you know, I, like I said, like I was a football player yeah, and yeah. I looked a certain way and it was sort of like, why is he hanging out with us? Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, I felt much more comfortable with, I, those were my people. Uh, okay. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so it was, it was cool. And again, it was perfect for me because yeah, I, yeah. I needed it at that point. Okay. And yeah. did you major in writing? Yeah, I did. Okay. I majored in creative writing. Um, it was a good writing program. Mm-hmm. I studied, uh, poetry, okay. which obviously is not, you know, something that, yeah, yeah. that you're going to do unless you're really, really good, uh, which I wasn't. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, I, again, maybe it has something to do with, with feeling rebellious or mm-hmm. feeling alienated or whatever, but, um, I studied poetry, did a lot of creative writing. And then after school, after I finished college, Mm -hmm. um, it was one of these things where I was just like, well, I don't know if you feel the same way, but Mm -hmm. um, writing is a skill that I have. Writing is something that I know I love to do. So let's figure out how to, how to use it, you know? And, and um, so I found myself in the Seattle area and Olympia first and then Seattle. And um, I was a kid who, would just write as much as I could write mm-hmm. and who was obsessed with music and loved music and finally found a way to kind of weasel my way into okay. getting a column in the local paper. And, you know, so yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. What'd you write about? Did you just like- Well, so by the time I had that column, I was a DJ. Uh, I was playing a lot of electronic. Mm-hmm. This is the nineties. So I was obsessed with drum and bass, yeah. which I don't even think is a thing anymore. <laughs> uh, I think um, it's like totally underground. Now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but so the column that I was writing was, I was the, the electronic and hip hop okay. guy, yeah. um, it, which in the, in the nineties in Seattle, you know, everybody was into one thing, obviously, mm-hmm. like there was a real kind of post grunge movement and indie rock movement happening, but they needed somebody who could be the like resident go to yeah. person to talk about that stuff. So I was I was that guy. Okay. And did yeah. you like doing that? Right. Yeah, I loved it. it. Yeah. Um it didn't last all that long because again, it being the time and the and the place, mm-hmm. um this was, you know, 
now we're at 2000 in Seattle and dot com boom was happening yeah. and Microsoft is there. And, um, so after, after doing, after freelance writing for a couple of years, I moved into a role writing content, writing reviews mm-hmm. and aggregating music content yeah. from around the web for a, for a dot com. Um, and then after the dot com bust happened, mm-hmm. they shut down our entire division and laid a, a bunch of us off. Yeah. And um, in the aftermath of that, I started up an online magazine, which is art, music, and literature. Um, and it was trampoline, all about trampoline, trampoline house. house. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, I can't believe you do that. <laughs> um, you, you did do some research. <laughs> it doesn't even. I don't, I don't think I even have the domain name uh-huh. anymore. But um, yeah, I built the site myself, and I, the idea was just to kind of you know surface mm-hmm. some of these underground or emerging you know, artists and acts and writers. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, I did that for a little bit. It was, it was cool though, because, um, this, the, the dot com where I worked, um, coming out of that, you know, I started up, uh, an online magazine and mm-hmm. another buddy of mine and colleague of mine there started up, um, a record label which started out as doing reissues of old like soul and funk yeah. records and um uh it's called light in the attic and they okay, still yeah, do yeah. like they're I love them. Yeah, yeah right they're really i think one of the best yeah. reissue and they don't only do reissues but they do a lot of reissues mm-hmm. and they really like i mean matt sullivan who started the label yeah. like he's got an amazing ear and I remember being there working with him yeah. and you know we were all just sort of music geeks and he would come to work and be like mm-hmm. have you heard this it's amazing <laughs> and we'd be like whoa where'd you hear that that's yeah. so weird and it was always like that's so weird and now it's like you know he discovered Roger Rodriguez and yeah, you know yeah, like yeah. uh and and some of the stuff that he has has reissued Betty Davis and stuff it's amazing but um it was great just working with that mm-hmm. level of talent. Another person we worked with, actually our boss, um, uh, went and started her own agency yeah. that like blew up and got huge. And another one is out here now in New York, and she uh, has been she's the editor in chief at um, uh, she's not anymore, but she at Discovery Communications, okay. I think. And so it was it was just cool to like be there when we were all young and yeah, kind yeah. of didn't know anything, uh-huh. and to <laughs> see everybody kind of what after the the dot com fell apart, mm-hmm. like to see how what each happened. person kind of took it in their own yeah. direction. Yeah. Did your in your nonfiction writing did any of your poetry skills come into play? Um, what you knew about poetry. Um, a little bit, Mm. I would say more indirectly. Mm -hmm. Um, you said in my nonfiction writing, yeah. um, I mean, certainly the muscles that you build and develop writing poetry, Mm -hmm. um, give you a little bit more of a, of an appreciation of the way words, you know, are strung together Mm -hmm. or can be strung together or a more kind of unique or intricate turn of phrase. Yeah. Um, but also writing and even reading poetry is hard. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so I think that, um, I think that I certainly, I came to, I brought a more kind of, Sorry, I'm having a hard time articulating this. Mm-hmm. I brought a, a different approach to my nonfiction writing, yeah. I think, because this was all at the beginning of blogging and stuff, mm-hmm. and it was all very like stream of consciousness yeah. and just like I'm a person who listens to a lot of records and so or whatever. I'm a person who knows a lot about this uh-huh. thing, and so I can just like spit everything out on the page and just put it there and yeah. put it out there. Um, and I felt like, I felt like at least at that moment, and it's probably still true now, you didn't have to be a writer to be a writer. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. You were just a writer because you were a person who knew about a thing, mm-hmm. and then you just told the world about that thing yeah. via writing. Whereas I came to it 
from a person who had who loved and cared about the craft of writing. Mm-hmm. And I would revise my stupid, like, you know, <laughs> live show synopsis yeah. like five times because I didn't like the way it flowed. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. So, and that's, that's kind of been a problem of mine ever since. <laughs> <laughs> I still do Endless that. revisions. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and obsessing over, uh, over little things. Okay. And, yeah. Why is uh, reading poetry hard? Because it is something that people are intimidated by. People are intimidated by it. Yeah. And, you know, obviously poetry has changed. Um, and so there's, it's my opinion mm-hmm. that anybody can find a poem that means something to them yeah. and that resonates with them. Um, they just have to look for it. Yeah. But a lot of the poetry that's in the, that's more, you know, available or accessible or mm-hmm. in the mainstream um, isn't necessarily what's, right for them yeah. and you know you could argue getting back to hip-hop that like that's where hip-hop came from mm-hmm. um because it is you know a type of poetry yeah. that speaks to people on a different level and um through you know different kind of mechanism but um <clears throat> writing poetry is hard because for the most or reading poetry is hard because for the most part it's not straightforward mm-hmm. it's not you know, it's starting to rain outside and that's making me sad because yeah. I'm thinking about how, you know, my mom has cancer. Yeah. Whatever. Okay. Like it, it's, it's, it's poem or it's, it's, uh, um, literature that deals in imagery and it's literature that deals in symbolism. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, I think that poets, while they might want to talk about the feelings they have around their mom's mm-hmm. cancer, um, they will spend hours or days or weeks or months or whatever yeah. perfecting the image of the rain that's falling outside mm-hmm. the window because because that means something to them, um, which I think is beautiful. Yeah. Uh, but the person who's reading it, they might also think it's beautiful, but mm-hmm. they might not pick up, you know, the the deeper meaning okay. or the the more human yeah. kind of deeper emotion that's there. You know okay. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, but I don't know. Maybe maybe that's a ridiculous way to describe it. But but um, I just think the language in poetry mm-hmm. sometimes tends to be a little bit more inscrutable or okay. a little bit less direct. You okay. know? Did um, you have your? I'm sorry. That's right. Uh, did you have your favorites? I did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's been a long it's been a long time since uh, I've been a real uh poetry fan. I my last I shouldn't say my last, but um I kind of haven't gotten over mm-hmm. um Dennis Johnson. And okay. Dennis Johnson is of course known as a novelist. Yeah, yeah. Recently um, passed. Yeah, recently yeah. passed. But um he like the the best kept secret is that his poetry is amazing. Really? And and I just recently, a couple of weeks ago, oddly enough, I just revisited it um, and, and really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, some contemporaries who, who I, I appreciate are Ed Skoog, who's writing in Portland, um, Kate Marvin, uh, a guy named Zach Barocas, mm-hmm. who's here in Brooklyn. Um, we're not in Brooklyn right now, but he's yeah. in, in our area. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 So after you, you leave Washington, right? Mm-hmm. How do you, is it New York next? New York next. Okay. So um, the Trampoline House, the magazine, yeah. um, was named Best New Online Magazine mm-hmm. by South by Southwest in okay. 2004. And, um, you know, that was that was right when South by was starting to be a big thing. Yeah. And I really like, I was just, I was convinced that I had just hit it big. Mm-hmm. Like this was it. This is my moment. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to take this. I'm going to move to New York. I'm going to blow it up, uh-huh. make it big. Like Jan Winter, look out. Yeah. I'm going to be the next Rolling <laughs> Stone. And so, um, I had a friend out here who was actually the person that I mentioned who, um, ended up being, um, the editor in chief at, at she's not 
at Discovery anymore, but she was. She's now at Audible. But um, she's a good friend of mine from back in the day. Mm -hmm. And um, she had a spare bedroom. And so I just came out here and yeah. like gave it a try for a little bit. Uh -huh. um, and uh, ended up loving it. Ended up realizing that I actually could make it okay. in New York. Um, <clears throat> sort of. <laughs> uh, so I stayed, but, um, very, so after I'd been here for um, a few months, um, this is about six months, I opened up a gallery space. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is after I'd settled on my own, gotten out of my friend's spare bedroom. Um, and in the, the ground floor of the building I was living in, yeah. they had a, a vacant space so I talked the landlord into letting me do, you know, what we would probably call a pop-up gallery okay. now. But at the time, it was just like, why don't you let me do this yeah, and yeah. see what happens? Because um, uh, even in 2004, you could still do that in in New York, in Brooklyn at least. Um, it was an art. It was a gallery and performance space, mm -hmm. and the idea was that I would kind of take some of the artists and try to do like a like a brick and mortar. Um, incarnation yeah. of the website. And so um, that existed for about a year, a little mm -hmm. under a year. And then I came down one morning to open up shop and an entire wall with art on it yeah. had been torn down. Okay. So uh, there was a vacant space next door. Uh -huh. There was a new tenant there and um, you know, they were remodeling and she uh, had yeah. a team come in and yeah. do demo and they just tore down. They, they got it basically instead of just gutting her space, they gutted okay. both spaces because they didn't, you know, know better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so that was that moment where I just sat down with my head in my hands yeah. and I was like, what now? Um, and, uh, ended up picking up a few jobs, freelance jobs in the marketing world. Mm -hmm. And that turned into a marketing career. And, um, then in Oh nine, some of my music industry contacts came back into on the radar. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, I went to Warner music group to start and build their direct to consumer, basically digital marketing yeah. team. Um, and so that was nice to kind of like bring it, you know, full yeah. circle, um, and get back into the music world. And, uh, so I was doing, you know, digital and marketing mm -hmm. and stuff for, for the music space. Okay. And, yeah. And did you have, was the thought of making, uh, writing a book always there? Or? Um, well, coming out of school, I wanted to write a real book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, as, as I think a lot of 22 year old writing students, yeah. you know, I thought that I was going to write the great American, the uh -huh. next great American novel. Um, unfortunately I didn't have anything to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, I mean, maybe you feel the same way. It, it, again, going back to the idea that it's it's always kind of there. It's mm -hmm. always, it's a skill that you can fall back on, but it's also, I don't know if if everybody feels this way, but it, it was also, it's also kind of a dream that I fall back yeah, on. Yeah. Um, and so the way the punk book happened, uh, and which led me to Akashic books, and which led me to the hip-hop book, mm -hmm. was... I was just out with my son, who was probably six months old at the time. Um, we were walking through Brooklyn from our apartment up to Prospect mm -hmm. Park, and um, there was uh, somebody was having a stoop sale, yeah. and they had a little um, board book out there that they were selling that was, I think it was called This is Pink. Okay. And it was like, oh, this is a picture of a pig, and here's a picture mm -hmm. of a flamingo, and just, you know. <laughs> um, but I misread it out of the corner of my yeah. eye, and I thought it said... I, I joked that I thought it said, this is punk. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that became like that stuck and it became a running joke. But, but immediately for me, it was like, somebody needs to write that book. Yeah. I need to write that book. And so, yeah, so it was the kind of thing where, um, you know, I hadn't, I had kind of given up the ghost of, you know, being a, a real author, yeah, yeah. but it was still in the back of my mind that like, when an idea would strike mm -hmm. or a creative urge would strike, it would kind of always go back to the let's write it, okay. let's turn it into something in print. You know, mm -hmm. that's kind of where the the magazine, which turned into Trampoline House, 
uh, came from. Too, oh, okay. You know, so, yeah. And when did the idea after you did the punk rock book to do the hip hop? When did that come? Um, <laughs> frankly, it came before I was done with the punk rock okay. book. You know, I mean, uh, I really enjoyed the creative process. I really enjoyed working with Annie mm-hmm. E, who's the the illustrator. And she did all the illustrations in Play-Doh, like actual store-bought yeah. Play-Doh. Um, and she was amazing. And so the creative process was was really exciting and invigorating for me. And, um, you know, it was like before we were even done, I was uh-huh. like, I want to keep doing this. Uh-huh. And, um, y- you know, it, it's like you can't really compartmentalize when you're talking about um, something that you love yeah. and a type of music or a type of art that you mm-hmm. love. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't, I don't stop loving hip hop when I put on a punk record, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? So we would be ta- I would be, you know, writing version after version of a piece about the clash or mm-hmm. whatever. And I would kind of get that in my head yeah. And then I would go home and listen to whatever I was listening to, and I want to write a book about that, you know. Um, and uh, specifically Annie's style of artwork and style of illustration—it's mm-hmm. uh, not really illustration; I just call it that because it's in a in a book. Yeah. Like she, you know, she makes actual three D figures, and and she also works in video. Mm-hmm. She does stop motion animation. Um, and before we had even published what is punk, I was like. If I get a chance to do this again, it has to be hip hop because mm-hmm. I love hip hop yeah. because there's so much story to tell and because I can't, you know, talk about music without sharing my love for hip hop. Mm-hmm. But also, I need to see a Play-Doh Biggie Smalls. <laughs> 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 like, I pretty much would have done this entire book yeah. about Biggie Smalls just because I was like, obviously, the man is sort of made out of Play-Doh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and he's like, style of, of art is so perfect. So, like, I mean, the Biggie page I didn't even do until close to the end, yeah. but I was, like, really saving it up. Because I wanted to see the biggie. <laughs> What's going to look like? Yeah. Okay. yeah. How do you fun. approach putting the book together? Like, do you outline it first? Like, We, we started out with the, um, the list of artists, mm-hmm. which was really hard. Um, my original vision for it was to do it in volumes. Mm-hmm. So I wanted, to, I wanted to do volume one, old school. Yeah. And volume two, you know, golden age. And volume three would be something post, you know, 2000, Mm -hmm. however you want to title it, Golden Age Part 2 or whatever. Um, uh, And the first book was 32 pages, um, which felt like kind of the right length for this, you know, for this audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And most of most of the of the spreads that we did were two page spreads yeah so that really limited how much we could we could do mm-hmm. and i kind of felt like okay well i can easily fill 32 pages if i go from you know 78 to 88 or yeah. 78 to the end of the 80s and like maybe we start with you know cool herc and grandmaster flash mm-hmm. and we and, and we go all the way up to public enemy and then maybe the next book like kicks off with some of the like the rage you know and like we go maybe we start with pe and go into like nwa and then Mm -hmm. but then we can sort of like mellow it out and go into you know east coast and Uh de la soul and tribe whatever so i had this this sort of like idea in my head of how Uh it would work um but as we uh as i worked with the publisher on it um we decided that it should be one Mm -hmm. big is kind of encyclopedic yeah. thing, um, so that was a little that was a little heartbreaking for yeah, me because yeah. it meant we had to lose some of the artists I really loved, like Slick Rick isn't in there, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, um, yeah, there, there's there's a bunch, but because um, you put those on the inside cover, yeah, that didn't make, yeah, it. Uh, and and I wanted to do so we have a we have a great one of my favorite pages in the book is the page that's about b boying and, mm-hmm. and uh, graffiti. Um, and we have a few pages like that yeah. where I kind of talk about, you know, 
the art of the DJ mm-hmm. and, and all that. But I wanted to do more of that. Um, and that ended up getting cut. So I was glad that we could put them yeah. into the, the front and back cover. Okay. Yeah. So we got Russell Simmons in there mm-hmm. and we got Rick Rubin in there. And I, that was important to me. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so to answer your question, we started with an artist list mm-hmm. and had to cut it way down, way down, way down. And, um, um, and then I just started writing it, mm-hmm. um, and just like picked, picked an artist and would kind of try. And it, it was, it, it was a lot harder than I expected it mm-hmm. to be. Um, um, because, you know, there are specific things that you may feel this way when you, an artist of any genre, yeah. if you were to say, you know, name, like if you were to pick an artist mm-hmm. and say, give me the four or five bullet points you yeah. want covered, um, those may be album titles, mm-hmm. they may be styles, they may be particularly in hip hop, like there's a lot about, you know, origin story yeah. and G ge- and geography. And, um, so there were, I had to work around <laughs> words and phrases, yeah. uh, that were, that were tough. Um, to make it age appropriate, to make it age appropriate. Yeah. yeah. And also just to make it like rhyme and mm-hmm. fun and, and short <laughs> is the, the book is a little long right now. And there are pages in particular where, um, especially visually like mm-hmm. there's just too many words on the page okay. but but i i just refuse to cut some yeah, of them yeah. you know because it's like well you know you've got a character like dr dre and like you can't talk about dr dre mm-hmm. without snoop and then eminem and then 50 yeah, cent yeah, yeah, and yeah. then like but you gotta work backwards and you've got nwa <laughs> and you've got ice cube and you know like do you talk about Snoop without talking about, I don't know, like Nate dog or, yeah, you know, yeah. like it's, I mean, it's, you know, it's a, it's a family pages. tree. Yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, so it was, it was tough mm-hmm. and, um, I've already seen a little bit of feedback in the press of, I mean, you know, people are passionate about yeah, hip hop yeah, yeah. and they all have their favorites <laughs> and it's hard to read a book that doesn't cover your favorites yeah, the yeah. right way. Yeah. Okay. So did you know from the beginning that you were a few things that it would be a prism to discuss racism, uh, feminism, like where the part where you says that, uh, girls can do what boys can do. Uh-huh. And to also that hip hop is a culture. So that includes the music, graffiti and break dancing. Did you know those things early on or? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, those were, those were things that on a personal level I felt really passionate mm-hmm. about. Um, and it, it was, it was interesting again, just through the process of editing and kind of trying to be pragmatic about it all. You know, mm-hmm. how is this going to fit into a book? Um, a lot of it got cut and a lot of it was, there was a lot of, you know, it was tough in terms of picking artists yeah. because like you don't want it to be just a bunch of guys, yeah. you know, and, and you don't want to send a message that for, you know, 10 straight years, only men were, were driving this culture. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you've got people like you've got the kind of internal, you have to narrow it down and you have to decide if you're going to put in, you know, Queen Latifah and Salt and Peppa, like yeah. who are you going to lose? So, so anyway, there was, there was a lot of that, but it was, it was very important to me. And fortunately it was important as well to, to Nelson mm-hmm. and to Johnny at Akashic that, that we be really clear about, um, uh, you know, just in general kind of values that, mm-hmm. that we as people share, but yeah. also kind of the, the strength and the breadth of hip hop as mm-hmm. a culture. Like, if I wanted it to be what is rap, it could yeah. have been what is rap. But to me, what is hip hop is much broader mm. and much more inclusive across the board of different people, different races, yeah. different, you know, stylistic uh, preferences, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I mean, it's, it's a, without sounding like trite, it's, it's an amazing power, amazingly powerful culture yeah 
you know, and like you could go for days just talking about and studying particular specific niches of mm-hmm. it or just like the visuals of it, you know, yeah. and obviously like street art is a, a huge thing now. Mm-hmm. Um, and that has its, you know, that's, that's hip hop. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't want to just be like, this guy's a good rapper. Yeah. You know, yeah. I wanted it to be like, what does this mean? And mm-hmm. this is, this is powerful stuff. And, and getting back to the meaning and the importance for the kids who mm-hmm. might read it. I think you could argue that, for a large proportion of the kids who Mm -hmm. might come in contact with this book, they may, I don't know if they'll ever (laughs) Mm -hmm. uh, come into contact with something that hasn't been touched or shaped by hip hop. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, at this point in our sort of cultural history, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, it started as this niche little thing yeah. and everybody's like, well, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's shaped every portion of our yeah. lives. You and know? for people who have never lived without it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like it's always been there for them. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that I, that I, uh, that's another, I'm glad you brought that up mm-hmm. cause that's another, um, thing that felt important to me about telling the story mm-hmm. is, and it's really hard to um, to communicate, uh, but just how what a revolution it was, and what mm-hmm. a what a crazy, amazing new you know frontier yeah. this was musically and artistically. Mm-hmm. And you were like, "How can they even do that?" Like yeah. you know, <laughs> I know that sound. That sounds that's by chic yeah you know and like that's a little bit of a of a song that i heard that i heard five years ago i used to love but now it sounds totally different and there's a guy (laughs) rapping over like that's crazy how can you do that you know i mean i you know my kids and kids today quote unquote (laughs) will just never appreciate just how groundbreaking yeah 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 like some guy bought two records of the most you know commercial music and put it on and took 45 seconds of it and bounced it back and forth. Yeah. And all of a sudden you have an entirely new. Yeah. Recontextualize it. Yeah. 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 And did you, what would you like to happen? So parents, they say they read these two books, the book to their kids. Do you want like kids to now listen to hip hop or just like, and how does that work for music that is often has explicit language? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I mean, I would love it if they, listen to hip hop Mm -hmm. just because as a hip hop fan, I think it's great. Um, the point of it was not necessarily to convert people into fans of hip hop, Mm -hmm. but much more to just tell a story of something that I think they're probably going to be fans of anyway. Um, and as a parent, you know, again, I, it's important to me and it's fun for me to Mm -hmm. kind of hand, this down to my kids. And I I know a lot of parents who read this to the kids will enjoy that, that part. Uh, and they can kind of like stop reading the middle of a page and, Mm -hmm. and share a story or whatever. Um, uh, but, uh, but I definitely think that an appreciation of the culture an appreciation Mm -hmm. of where it came from appreciation of, again, kind of the groundbreaking nature and the courage that Mm -hmm. a lot of these people had is, is really important. Yeah. And kind of the sense that, well, they did this so I can do anything, mm-hmm. you know, uh, is is important to me. Um, man, it does get tough when it gets into the lyrics question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my my two oldest kids, my two boys, are um, eight and a half and six, mm-hmm. and. Um, <laughs> They are, they're all over the place with the music they listen to. But right now in particular, um, (laughs) they're, uh, they're obsessed with baby got back. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) And you know, like they're walking around the house saying like my Anaconda don't want none. And you're like, no, 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 no. You can't say that. (laughs) Fortunately, he has no idea what it means. But like, you know, uh, and, um, oddly enough, 
so I said they were all over the place. Oddly enough, um, especially my eight-year-old is also into Flowrida. Okay. <laughs> who, who like, you know, is more modern and has a lot more kind of questionable content. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I wish I had an answer <laughs> for it. <laughs> Other than the fact that, it, you know, it's out there, yeah. it's going to be out there, and talking about it early yeah. or addressing it early. Um, well, there are edited, they can get the edited versions. Yeah, there's edited yeah, versions. Yeah. 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 Um, but it's funny because, um, you know, they they know what the bad words are. Mm-hmm. And um, it's funny because uh, they, they know all the words to Baby Got Back. Yeah. And they will say it and then they'll like, either they'll like either whisper or just stop <laughs> saying like when they get to yeah, like yeah. a bad word or word they're not supposed to say or whatever. Um, and my eight year old will say, you know, dad, he said it. So I'm just saying the, I'm just saying the song or whatever. And and I feel like, well, you know, like he, he knows, yeah. he has a sense of what his norms are yeah, yeah. and what's okay for him. Mm-hmm. And I'm not in the business of pretending that this stuff doesn't happen yeah, yeah. out in the world, but as long as he knows what's mm-hmm. okay for him. Getting back to why did I want to write what is hip hop? I mean, it's a it's an amazing opportunity mm-hmm. to kind of help parents and as a parent myself to like b- give this thing that I love so mm-hmm. much to my kids, you know, yeah, and to help them experience it the way I experienced mm-hmm. it, and not just be like, oh, you know, hey Google, play some Flow Rida, you yeah, know, like. Yeah. Like, I want to tell you about, that's not hip hop. I want to tell you about hip hop. You want to talk about hip hop? Here's LL Cool J. Yeah. You yeah. know, whatever. So, yeah. Because you got that in there, but. Oh shit. Google actually did. Hang oh, on. Okay. Just... Hey, Google, stop. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to keep that in there or not. That's pretty funny. God, exhibit A. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but I like the way the book, okay, you get the culture of the music in there, but too, I mean, you have the kids reading it with their parent. I mean, you use the word racism in there. So that gives mm-hmm. the parent like, okay, what's racism? The kid yeah. asks that and, you know, to talk about, you know, girls are equal to boys. Yeah. It brings up these issues and that they can be talked about in an age appropriate way. Yeah. That's a good point. And it, it might be, I didn't think about this until mm-hmm. you mentioned it, but, um, you know, the book goes through in a mostly chronological order although the point was not to be chronological Mm -hmm. about it and i've heard people say well you know you put page 11 before page 10 and chronologically you know but um so it goes through these artists and then all of a sudden you know you mentioned that the word racism in there it's in there in the public enemy page Mm -hmm. and um you know, that kind of like the book takes a little bit of a turn, just like the culture did, yeah. uh, towards like addressing these things. And, um, yeah, before that, it's just sort of like this guy was great and this, you know, yeah. artist was great and here's why and everybody likes their music. Mm-hmm. But then it's like Public Enemy had a, you know, a mission. Yeah. And, and, uh, it does give parents an opportunity to be like, okay, so here's, yeah. here's what we're talking about, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And did I read right? You're thinking about a new wave. Is that is that true? <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Uh huh. That's a little problematic. Uh huh. Um, just because new wave is is just a really, it's not a real like, it's not a real specific uh-huh. genre. It means different things to different people. Yeah. Um, and to some people, it means post punk, mm-hmm. and to some people, it means you know the kind of like early electronic mm-hmm. stuff that sort of bled into goth, even. Yeah, yeah. Um, and frankly, I love all of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know what we'll call it, but okay. going back to the when I was writing what is punk, and I kept thinking about Biggie Smalls. Um, I also feel like I, I, the other artist I uh-huh. keep wanting to see in Play-Doh, I, I keep wanting to see uh-huh. Annie do, is Bowie. Okay. So, like, Bowie himself doesn't really have a genre. Yeah. Because he's, all, you know, he's, he's done so genre. much. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, 
Yeah, so like kind of like a glam sort of David okay. Bowie thing or an electronic post-punk Devo thing. Mm. I feel like those guys could go into new wave. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's so I much. I just interviewed uh, Lori Majewski, and she did a oral history, her and Jonathan Bernstein. On, really? On new wave music. Yeah, it's uh, really? they picked, uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's called uh, yeah, Mad World, and they took 33, 36 songs. Uh-huh. From the whole era. So theirs was more like the new romantic. But there was the point of that Duran Duran was new wave, but also the Smiths were new wave. Yeah. And they were all during the same period. Yeah. So that's the thing. I, yeah. I'm glad and I'm mentioned Bowie, look that up. And mention Bowie, because Bowie yeah. was sort of like the whole, like almost everybody was this book were inspired by Bowie. Right. Yeah. Right. Like he's the history, part of the history of it. Yeah. So, uh, so I was thinking about, so when I, th- say new wave mm-hmm. i i think of bowie as almost like a godfather yeah, kind of yeah. thing and then it getting into this like early mid 80s it's interesting they said duran duran because i was yeah. thinking you know like smiths and mm-hmm. cure yeah they're but in then there maybe does depeche mode count and if depeche mode counts then does new order count okay. but if new order counts then does joy division yeah. count see and all then, those are in the book are they yeah all, those are all <laughs> okay good good this is this is very helpful. For yeah, me. yeah. <laughs> I would love to write. I would love to include. I would love to you know do a bit on Joy Division. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd love to see the play to uh, Robert Smith. Yeah, that would be oh fun. Yeah. I think Annie would really <laughs> love that too. Cool. Yeah. So well, let's hope. Yes, yes. I would definitely want that. And uh, what's the uh, best place for people to keep up with you online? Find out about the book, which they should definitely get. Should definitely get it. Yeah. Um, you're missing out yeah. if you're not getting it. <laughs> Read it right now. Read along. Um, I, I'm pausing for a second uh-huh. because I haven't, frankly, I need to do a little bit of work on the, the okay. hip hop uh, site. The the website for the book is bookofhiphop.com. Okay. Um, and uh, it's available through the publisher, Akashic mm-hmm. Books, obviously available on Amazon. Um, if you really want to hear me, mm. uh, being snarky and talking shit about <laughs> politics, then you can follow me on Twitter and yeah. I'm E.L. Morse. Um, but yeah, start at book of hip hop. Okay. and Go from there. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. And last thing, some of your favorite hip hop albums. Oh shit. Um, should I give you a limit? Yeah, give me a... Uh, I, why did, why didn't I expect this question? <laughs> I should have been ready for it. I just thought of it. <laughs> uh, uh, three? You want to do three? Is that, um, or is that like choosing limbs? Your favorite it it limb? is like choosing limbs. But <laughs> All right, I'll... Nobody hold me to this as my three favorite okay. because I'm going to get a lot of pushback. But the three that just popped into my uh-huh. head... Um, uh, follow the Leader, okay. Eric B. and Rakim... Um, let's do a Beastie Boys, Paul's Boutique, mm-hmm. and Black on Both Sides, most stuff. Okay, sweet, yeah. dude. Yeah. Excellent. Those are good ones. Thanks. Cool. I leave anything out? I don't think so. That I, was great. You, <laughs> you gave me about, uh, you gave me the opportunity to talk for 45 minutes, and uh-huh. I think I sp- talked for about two hours, <laughs> talking about poetry and talking about, Yeah. This is great, Eric. That was fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for doing this. Absolutely. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Eric Morse. Both books, What is Hip Hop? What is Punk? are both available at AkashicBooks.com and wherever you like to get your books. Great books for kids. And I would also say they are great books for collectors of hip hop memorabilia it is for everyone and again the website is bookofhiphop.com i'm online several places talkmusictalk.com for podcast information and to stream every single episode you can also find me on instagram at this is boys and some call to actions for you if you enjoy this episode please share it on social media email it to a friend leave a five-star rating and our review wherever you are listening especially on i tunes because this all helps to grow the talk music talk audience also 
Download the Talk Music Talk app. It is free for iPhone and Android, wherever you like to get your apps. Or you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Tune in just about everywhere. Just search for Talk Music Talk. You can also find the podcast on SoundCloud starting with episode 100. SoundCloud.com forward slash this is voice. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Till next time, and there will be a next time. This one's for you, Liz. Mm-hmm.